How good can the Buffalo Bills offensive line be in 2022? I'm going to break down the dynamics of the position group today on Locked On Bills. You are Locked On Bills, your daily Buffalo Bills podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, Bills Mafia? It's Joe Marino from the Draft Network, and I'm your host of Locked On Bills. Happy Friday to you, and thank you for making Locked On Bills your first listen every day, or if you are joining us on the YouTube channel, your first watch every day. Well, folks, it's offensive line day here on the podcast, just like we did for the wide receivers, running backs, and tight ends. We're talking offensive line, and we're going to break it down by reflecting briefly on 2021. Talk about what's new with the group and what does that tell us? Get into the biggest questions now and in the future. And then lastly, my expectations for this unit. I'm excited to talk about this offensive line because I think I have some unique thoughts on the group. Thoughts that I haven't really seen as much from other analysts and content creators. So let's get into it. Starting with a a quick reflection on 2021. The Bills' offensive line last year was a bit of a journey, right? Pretty disappointing for most of the season. At least that's the way it felt, right? I remember midseason, we were talking all about the offensive line help that the Bills could get in the draft for the coming year and just how they really needed to focus on building a wall in front of Josh Allen. We were pretty disappointed with how the Bills' offensive line played Really, I guess what I would say throughout the first 60, 70% of the season. Now, got a lot better late in the year and, and through the playoffs, but early on, middle of the season, the Bills' offensive line was not performing well. One thing that we have to remember about that is that the Bills used a lot of different starting offensive line combinations. The Bills used eight different starting offensive line combinations in 17 games. Think about that. You very rarely had the same group able to play together with any level of consistency. And we talk about the offensive line being five guys working together as one. Well, folks, that's difficult for you to play well when there's different bodies next to you on a weekly basis and guys are flipping over from tackle to guard or from the left side to the right side all the time. That really hindered the Bills' offensive line to go out and perform at a high level with any level of consistency. Eight different starting offensive line combinations in 2021. In games three through eight in 2021, the Bills used five different starting offensive line combinations in six weeks. So in a five-game excuse me, in a six-game stretch, the Bills used five different offensive line combinations. Eight overall. The Bills offensive line, if I were to give you two different metrics, and you you can take these for whatever you want, but two different metrics that will tell us something about the pass blocking and something about the run blocking is first of all, pass block, uh, pass blocking efficiency according to Pro Football Focus. So the Bills were number 12 in the NFL last season according to Pro Football Focus in pass blocking efficiency, which is a rating that measures pressures allowed on a per-snap basis weighting towards sacks allowed. So the Bills were just outside of the top 10 at number 12. Then when it comes to rushing, and this metric comes courtesy of Pro Football Reference, The Bills, on average, had 2.6 yards before contact on rushing plays. Ninth best in the NFL. So through those metrics, the Bills were a reasonable group. And I think in totality, I kind of feel that way. I don't think the Bills had an above-average offensive line last year. But given the circumstances, and in totality, I think the Bills had a reasonable average offensive line. 
So that's what I remember. That's how I that's how I feel about reflecting on 2021. A couple of quick thoughts on the four returning starters from last year, focusing in on 2021. Deion Dawkins at left tackle last year. I thought he had a great season. I really do. I know that people are kind of hung up on the one sack that he gave up against the Houston Texans, and for some reason, people thought that he couldn't play because he gave up that sack where he got he got beat clean. Right? That happens. But for the most part, Deion was awesome. And he really turned it on late in the season. Mitch Morris, the Bills' starting center, thought he had a good season. Obviously, a difficult scenario when the guys next to you are different all the time. And that's the guy that felt it the most was Mitch Morse, where the, the guy next to him on either side was pretty much different on a weekly basis. He still gave the Bills high quality contributions as a starting center and continues to be a durable football player. Ryan Bates, obviously we love what happened there late in the season when he got his chance to play. And the narrative, it changed so quickly, right, where there was a large contingency of of fans that were wondering, well, what's this guy's role? He could back up all five spots, but can he actually play? And as the Bills were going through all these different offensive line combinations, it came down to, well, can Bates help? Can he play? Can we give him a chance? And then he does, and the Bills' offensive line turns around, and then in a matter of a month and a half, we're concerned about not being able to bring him back as a starter. Well, the Bills obviously believe in Ryan Bates and gave him that four-year contract extension, and he's locked in now to a starting guard position. So you want to talk about a player that going into the season we thought is just, hey, this is a backup. Now he's a starter that everybody really likes. And then Spencer Brown, Bills' third-round pick out of Northern Iowa. The fact that the Bills prioritized getting him on the field in week, was it week four? It was Houston. I don't know if that was week three or four. But he became a starter early in his rookie season. And you've heard me talk about Spencer Brown. I mean, this guy is an unbelievable talent, right? Just size, athleticism, as good as it gets. Spencer Brown might be the best athlete in the NFL when you account for size-adjusted athleticism. He's unreal. Long arms, tall frame, good size, and just a world-class athlete for his size. But he was raw, right? He, He came to the Bills after not playing at all in 2020. He only had two seasons at Northern Iowa where he Net Northern Iowa, where he actually played games as an offensive lineman. And in high school, he played tight end in eight man football. So, yeah, you recognize the physical gifts, but a big ask for a guy that was relatively inexperienced in raw to come in and, and start for you right away. I didn't anticipate that happening. But obviously, he forced the issue. And while he had plenty of inconsistency, I look back at Spencer Brown's rookie season. And I'm glad that he got playing time. And I'm excited about what he can develop into, especially now with Aaron Cromer as the offensive line coach. So as as far as the four returning starters, that's kind of what I think about them. And um, hopefully that sets the stage for you know the rest of our, our conversation here today. From the people who invented healthy and tasty comes the latest gift to your taste buds. You've probably tried the amazing coconut brownie chunk built bar but guess what your friends at built have given coconut brownie chunk the puffs treatment that's right the coconut brownie chunk built bar flavor you love in a deliciously chewy marshmallow covered in 100 real chocolate it's like a fluffy cloud of coconut brownie goodness but stop drooling and listen they are good for you low calorie low sugar high protein and all delicious Coconut brownie chunk puffs are only here for a limited time, so go to Built.com now to make sure you don't miss out. They're going fast because they taste so good. And as you guys know, all Built Bars are made with collagen protein, which your body absorbs more efficiently and provides a ton of health benefits. You can eat something that tastes good and is good for you. Try them out now. Go to Built.com. Use our promo code LOCKED15. You'll get 15% off your next order. Again, that's promo code LOCKED15 for 15% off at Built.com. So there's some newness to this Bills offensive line this year. 
starting with the personnel, the Bills basically said goodbye to John Feliciano and Darrell Williams. And when I say they said goodbye, they cut those players. Took advantage of the opportunity to create some cap space. But also another opportunity I think that you'll see very clearly here in just a moment. So you say goodbye to John Feliciano and Darrell Williams, and you welcome to the mix Roger Saffold, David Questenbury, Greg Manns, and Greg Van Roten, in addition to a draft pick in Luke Tenuta, late-round pick out of Virginia Tech. The Bills also extended Ryan Bates and brought Ike Bucker back on a one-year deal, despite uh, the Achilles injury late in the season. So what does this tell us, right? You, you say goodbye to Feliciano and Williams. You say hello to Saffold, Questenbury, Greg Manns. You, you bring back Ryan Bates. What does that tell us? Well, it very clearly tells me that there's a huge, huge emphasis on movement skills and athleticism with the Bills' offensive line. Huge. The Bills got massively more athletic, massively more rangy with the offensive linemen that they have at their disposal. And you guys may remember in June, I did a podcast on ranking the Buffalo Bills players overall in terms of athleticism through the relative athletic score metric. So it's a size-adjusted metric that ranks players on a 0 to 10 scale in terms of their athleticism based on historical data for the position and athletic testing. So in 2020, the Bills offensive line, and again, a 10 is as high as you can get for your RAS score. In 2020, the Bills at left tackle had Deion Dawkins, 8.8 RAS score. John Feliciano, the primary player at left guard, he had a 3.2 RAS score, a very poor athlete. Mitch Morse, 9.57, that's very high. Cody Ford, a 6.33. And then Darrell Williams at right tackle, 2.53. That average is out to a 6.08 on average across your five starting offensive linemen. 2021, completely, or excuse me, 2022, completely different story based on what the Bills brought in. You still have Dawkins at an 8.8, but at left guard, you go from Feliciano at a 3.2 to Roger Saffold at an 8.61. Huge upgrade athletically. You still have Mitch Morrison as 9.57 at center. Then at right guard, you go from Cody Ford at a 6.33 to Ryan Bates at a 9.57. Then at right tackle, you go from Daryl Williams at a 2.53 to Spencer Brown at a 10. And so if you average it out, it's now a 9.31 across your five starters. So you go from a 6.08 to a 9.31. The Bills are significantly more athletic up front than they were a year ago. And maybe you think David Questenbury could be the starting right tackle. And maybe that'll be the case, even if it is him, his RAS score is a 927. So another elite caliber athlete that the Bills brought in to play offensive line. There was a huge emphasis on becoming more athletic with the offensive line. What does that tell us? Well, an identity in the run game that's rooted in being a zone rushing offense. You have so much range on this group. You can get guys going on longer poles. You can get them climbing to the second level. You can get them working laterally and trust that they're going to get to their landmarks. You can really evolve the offense, right? The Bills' run, rushing attack has been multiple, right? Air quotes, multiple. Well, they had players like Feliciano, like Darrell Williams, who I have a lot of respect for Darrell Williams. Don't get me wrong. But he was a player that limited the Bills' ability to really work the zone rushing offense because he doesn't have range. I mean, he's a very poor athlete. Now, I think that somebody should sign Darrell Williams to be a starter for them this year, but that would be a team that employs more of a gap power run scheme, a team like the New England Patriots. That style of rushing offense would love to have a player or should love to have a player like Darrell Williams. But for the Bills, guys like him and John Feliciano, who just don't have the range and movement skills, it inhibits your ability to truly be a multiple run scheme because you don't have the mobility. 
That's going to change this year. Evolving the offense, you have more range, you have lateral mobility. Then the other thing that this signals to me is an emphasis on improving the right side of the Bills' offensive line. Earlier this week, if I'm not mistaken, I went through the 2021 season and I gave you the percentage of pressures allowed from each spot on the Bills' offensive line. And at left tackle, it was 15%, or excuse me, 5%. At left guard, it was 17%. At center, it was 13%. And then the right center, the right side of the offensive line, right guard, 23%. Right tackle, 26%. When I, you've signed Roger Saffold, which allows Ryan Bates to go over at right guard, and that should be a nice upgrade in terms of pass protection. And then you have Spencer Brown in year two competing with David Questenbury to be the right tackle, and that should lead to a more stable, better situation. And so the Bills were very self-aware of where they needed to get better on the offensive line, which was the right side, and they made good moves that's going to shore that side up. So I love that. that. That's another thing that these moves signal to me about the way the Bills felt about this offensive line and how they wanted it to be better in 2022. And the last thing, and maybe the most important thing, what's different about this offensive line this year compared to last year is Aaron Cromer, now the offensive line coach, one of the most respected offensive line coaches in the league and has been for a couple decades now. This guy's resume is off the charts with the young players that he's developed, but also the, the established veterans that took a step and played the best football of their career under a guy like Aaron Cromer. You saw it in Buffalo. You saw it in Chicago. You saw it in, in New Orleans. I mean, this guy is as sharp as they come as an offensive line coach and is just really in tune with technique and how to tailor it to his individual players and rework a lot of what they do to get rid of some bad habits and allow them to, to grow and develop. And I'm really, really excited about Aaron Cromer and his influence on this offensive line. And so I think he's a big upgrade from Bobby Johnson. And I'm excited to see what that means for guys like Ryan Bates and Spencer Brown and Tommy Doyle. Even, even Morrison Dawkins, established players, right, that have been fixtures for this group. How much better can they be under Aaron Cromer? Very, very excited to find out. BetOnline.net is your number one source for all your betting needs and sports information. You can find all the latest sports developments, league reviews, and news this season, including football's futures. They got the NBA Summer League esports, Vegas casino games, anything you want, you can find it over at Bet Online. It is a phenomenal resource, a super easy to use website that you can check out on your desktop or mobile device. Have some fun over there. They got boxing, they've got golf, MMA, super fun. Love wagering over at Bet Online. It's Bet Online and it's where the game starts. All right, so let's get into my biggest questions now and in the future. I only have four things down, but we're going to cover a lot in these four things. And the first question, the, the number one lead thought on my mind when I think about the Bills offensive line in 2022 is who is the starting right tackle? You know, Spencer Brown's the incumbent. We're all excited for Spencer Brown. But David Questenbury is here. And David Questenbury had an amazing season last year for the Tennessee Titans. And oh, by the way, David Questenbury has been the Bills' right tackle throughout the entire offseason to this point because Spencer Brown has not been available as he recovers from an offseason procedure. So while Brown might be the incumbent and the exciting toolsy player with a high ceiling, David Questenbury might be the better player right now. And so I, I am 100% not sleeping on the possibility that Questenbury wins this job. And would that be disappointing? I mean, maybe. You've heard me pound the table for Spencer Brown and what I think he, he can become, but if the best right tackle for the Buffalo Bills in 2022 is David Questenbury, well, he should play. And David and Spencer Brown can use this year to develop and provide some depth and maybe be used as a utility offensive lineman but the Bills have a good problem to have when it comes to competition at right tackle. And let's be quite honest. 
Spencer Brown didn't deserve to be handed the job this year, right? He's a player that's still earning it, right? He's got to find his way, prove who he is in the league. You don't just hand guys like that starting jobs, right? So at a, at a minimum, David Questenbury is a really, really good competitor for that job that should push Spencer Brown. And I'm sure Spencer Brown feels some type of way watching Questenbury do his job all offseason long. Now that could all change at camp, right? When the pads come on, you really find out what these guys are made of. But we have a legit position battle here for the starting right tackle job. So that's first and foremost for me. The next thing that I think a lot about is, is who is the right guard and who is the left guard between Bates and Saffold? You know, this is a question that I've, I've looked at a few different times this offseason. And you know, the early indication based on what we've learned from OTAs in, in minicamp is that Saffold's the left guard and Bates is the right guard. And I know that some people are kind of hung up on this because when you think about it, Ryan Bates played really good at left guard last year for the Bills. And Roger Saffold is this savvy veteran, experienced player that if he's the right guard, you know, it could be a real benefit to a young player like Spencer Brown next to him. I understand that logic. However, there's, other, there's more to it, right? It's not that simple. These are the things that I think about when I, I'm considering who should be the left guard and who should be the right guard. Well, first of all, Roger Saffold has been a left guard since 2016. It's 2022, folks. He's been playing left guard for a long time. Essentially, his last 6,000 NFL snaps have come at left guard. 9,208 of his 10,062 snaps have come as a left side player. 92% of over 10,000 snaps as a left side player. There's a lot of established muscle memory right there for a guy like Roger Saffold. Meanwhile, Ryan Bates has played a total, a total of 575 career snaps, and he's been cross-trained uh, up and down the line of scrimmage, right? Tackle spots, both sides, center, guard. So while it's a great idea to think about how you keep and maintain what Bates provided at left guard, and you think about what Saffold can give your team at right guard next to Spencer Brown, you got to play your best left guard and you got to play your best right guard. And I think there's enough information here that tells me that Saffold should be the left guard, Bates should be the right guard. And you got to commit to it and stick with it because you want these guys dialed in technique wise. And you don't want to have them flipping back and forth and having to break habits and relearn everything the opposite way by you know, juggling them around. So I think it's going to be Saffold at left guard and Bates at right guard. And I think it should be. Number three is who are the primary backups? We got the five starters, right? And when I say five starters, I mean Dawkins, Saffold, Morse, Bates, and then we'll call it Spencer Brown right now at right tackle. And so that means between David Questenbury, Greg Manns, Tommy Doyle, Cody Ford, Greg Van Roten, who I think are your five best reserve players. You only got a spot for four of them, right? I think you're going you're gonna to roster nine offensive linemen. And so between Questenbury, Manns, Doyle, Ford, and Van Roten, assuming everyone stays healthy, one of those guys not making the team. And then that doesn't even get into Bobby Hart. You know, look, I don't think anybody expects him to make the team, but he's started a lot of games in the NFL. Luke Tenuta, who was a draft pick this year, those guys are certainly long long shots to make this roster. They're going to need some, some players to get injured to have a chance to make the team. And that doesn't even get into Ike Bucker, who's coming off of the injury. And look, he's probably going to start the year on the pup list, but the Bills didn't have to re-sign him. There had to be some level of optimism that he can come back and play and help this team even as a, as a reserve, which takes us back up to that group of Questenbury, Manns, Doyle, Ford, and Van Roten, and it further complicates that. These are great problems to have, but I'm really interested in seeing how the reserve offensive line situation shakes out. 
it's going to be fun to watch uh, those guys compete in preseason for those jobs. The last thing that I have down under the biggest questions now and in the future is what is the long-term plan at guard opposite of Ryan Bates? The Bills are in pretty good shape here with this offensive line and, and how they've got the key players signed, right? You have Deion Dawkins, Mitch Morris, and Spencer Brown. They're all signed through 2024. Ryan Bates is signed through 2025. So you're in real, real good shape here in terms of your key guys up front being under contract and you know providing some stability with who your guys are going to be at offensive line. I love it. But Roger Saffold is kind of a one-year thing, and you need an economic option in my mind. The Bills Bills roster is just getting crazy expensive. You know, expiring contracts right now like Tremaine Edmonds and Dawson Knox and Jordan Poyer and Devin Singletary and Roger Saffold. You you go one year ahead and you're starting to talk about Ed Oliver and Gabriel Davis. I mean – they're great problems to have, but it'd be nice for the Bills to get a major contributor at a low-cost deal. And I think their best chance to do it could come at the guard position next year. And boy, oh boy, wouldn't that be awesome if that player could be Tommy Doyle. And I never thought of Tommy Doyle as a guard, but the Bills are giving him some run at guard in OTAs. And I like that because Doyle... Super gifted athlete. Seems like he has great temperament and work ethic. And if he could be the answer at guard, that'd be phenomenal for this team. Have a fifth round starter and one of your as one of your offensive linemen. The Bills are going to need some of that, right? You can't pay all your starters $10 million a season. Like I know Brandon Bean's a wizard and he's been pulling off a lot of cool stuff, but man, at some point, you got you just can't keep them all. And so getting some low cost starters back in the mix is going to be really necessary. And I think one of those guard spots could be it. And I'm real interested to see if it could be Tommy Doyle again, never thought of him as a guard, but he's getting an opportunity to do it. And I'm guessing the bills are thinking a lot like, like I am in that, Hey, can can this guy be groomed to be that starter there in 2023? That's something I'll be paying big time attention to in, in camp and in preseason. So those are my big four questions. Let's close this thing out by working through my expectations for the unit. Have eight things written down here. Work through it quickly. The first thing that I'll say is is something that I've said numerous times. This is, in my opinion, the best offensive line the Bills have put in front of Josh Allen in his career to, to this date. And I just don't think we're talking enough about it. I think people are sleeping on this Bills offensive line. The talent and the coaching upgrades, they're notable. Now, it's got to come together, right? It's got to come together, but I believe in Coach Cromer, and I believe in this group of players that he has at his disposal. Deion Dawkins, keep performing at a high level. You just were voted a pro bowler last year. Hey, this is who you are, man. Keep showing that you're one of the best left tackles in the game. Roger Saffold, my expectation, come in and stabilize that guard spot. Mentioned this a lot. The one thing that's been a real revolving door for this Bills team over the last several years has been the guard position, just no stability at all. Saffold can really lock that down this year. For Ryan Bates, prove the Bills right. Four-year deal after... 575 snaps in the league. The guy signs a four-year, $16 million deal with the Bills. The Bears wanted him, right? Signed him to the offer sheet. The Bills matched, and he came back to Buffalo. Prove that the trajectory that you're on and the the contract that the Bills gave you is indicative of what the Bills can expect for the next several years. For Mitch Morse, hey, dude, enjoy stable guard play for the first time since you came to Buffalo. That's got to be exciting for him. Spencer Brown, go out and win the job, man. And if not, use that correctly. Take advantage of this year to hone in on your technique and position yourself really, really well to be that dude in 2023. For David Questenbury, either win that job 
or provide great depth at both left tackle and right tackle for this team. And then Tommy Doyle, give us some hope that you can be the future at guard or swing tackle. I want to see a step from Tommy Doyle. It's going to be one of the key players I watched this preseason. So I'm excited about this Bills offensive line. Excited about what it can get done in 2022, and I maintain that I believe that this is the best unit the Bills have put in front of Josh Allen yet in his career. All right, folks, that's going to do it for us here today on the podcast and this week. I'm thinking Monday is going to be the day where I drop my stat projections for the Buffalo Bills in 2022. Been doing this over the last couple of years. I think I've been pretty successful with it. And so I'm going to work on it this weekend. And if I feel good about where I come to, that'll be the podcast on Monday. But it'll happen at some point next week. I, I got to force myself to feel good about it. So whether that's Monday or Tuesday or whenever it comes, I'm going to box myself into doing it next week. So don't miss anything. Make sure that you're subscribed. We'd love it if you took a second to rate, review, and share the podcast. Enjoy your weekend. And I look forward to catching up with you again on Monday.